All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for the latest installment of Novel at Home, a series of virtual author events bringing authors to your living room or home office or patio or wherever you're Zooming these days. My name is Kat Leach and I'm the social media and promotions coordinator at Novel. Your support is invaluable to a small business like ours and we thank you for being with us tonight. We're thrilled to be hosting a virtual launch party for Dr. Beverly Sequoianis, assistant uh, professor of history at the University of Memphis, whose new book, Disturbing Spirits, was released this week. She'll be joined in conversation tonight by Dr. Sarah Skellinge, professor of history at Loyola University, Maryland. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. After I introduce our guests, I'll hide my own video during their conversation. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions you might have. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the talk, even though it probably won't be until the end when they get to it. I'll be in the chat to answer any behind the scenes questions you have. And feel free to use the chat uh, with each other as much as you like, um, but enter your questions in the Q&A, it's preferable. I'll also post links in the chat where you can order Disturbing Spirits from NovelMemphis.com. Without further delay, it's my honor to introduce tonight's guests. Dr. Sarah Scalinge is an Associate Professor of History at Loyola University, Maryland. She holds a Master of Arts in Arab Studies and a PhD in Middle Eastern and North African History from Georgetown University. At Loyola, she teaches courses ranging from women and gender in the Middle East and global histories of disability. Scalinge, who started teaching at Loyola in 2009, is originally from Italy. Her research focuses on the history of disability in the Middle East and in the Global South, and she is currently working on a book about disability in the colonial and modern Middle East to follow her first book, Disability in the Ottoman Arab World, 1500 to 1800. We're thrilled to have her with us tonight. And now for our featured <laughs> author, guest of honor, Dr. Beverly Stokoyanis is an assistant professor of history and author of Disturbing Spirits, Mental Illness, Trauma, and Treatment in Modern Syria and Lebanon. She holds a Master of Arts in History and a PhD in History from Washington University in St. Louis, where she was a Chancellor's Graduate Fellow. Sakoyanis joined the History Department at the University of Memphis in 2013, where she has taught courses in World History, Middle Eastern History, and Islamic History. She's originally from New York City and has family roots in Eastern Europe and the Dominican Republic. She attended college at Brandeis University in Massachusetts and spent a year of college studying abroad at Ben Gurion University in Israel. Apologies if that was not correctly pronounced. Her research has focused so far on the history of mental illness in Lebanon and Syria. And here in Memphis, Sakoyanis recently worked with Dr. Beverly Vaughn to host a panel on systemic racism and COVID in Memphis. She engages in peace and conflict studies with a commitment to diversity and inclusion. And this has included social justice research and disability rights activism, both domestically and abroad. Please join me in giving our guests a warm virtual welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah. uh, thanks to Jan and Rachel. Hey. <laughs> I guess Kat has officially disappeared from uh, from the screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started, and I just want to start by saying how just happy, really, generally happy from the bottom of my heart to be um, to hold your book in my hands because I first um, met you, Beverly, when you were a graduate student and you were just about to start writing your dissertation. And, uh, and it is so heartwarming to see you to have now gotten tenure and to have progressed, to have this wonderful book in my hands. So uh, congratulations, Beverly, this is an enormous accomplishment and I hope you are as proud of yourself as we are of you. So <laughs> thank you. Officially the Board of Trustees meets like this month, but thank you very much. <laughs> I'm taking it for granted. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let us start. What do you think? Let's start with the book's um, colorful cover. Could you tell us a little bit about why it looks the way it does? Why did you choose this cover? Well, 
Um, first, thank you also, you're awesome. So thank you for your support all these years, it's been great. Um, but so yeah, so the cover um, is a design based on the Syrian artist Anas Homsi's Wall of Memories, um, which he painted in 2015 after escaping the civil war in Syria and arriving in Lebanon. He and his wife, who is Syrian Lebanese, but like him is also a musician, an educator and an artist, um, are now based in Germany where they have a young son. And Homsi's wall of memories really struck me as having both incredible darkness in terms of personal and collective pain and tragedy, as well as resilience, even hope and optimism in it. And there's only a piece of Homsi's painting on the cover of the book, um, but it, the, the entire piece strikes really, it seemed to me like there are so many emotional and physical layers to it. These dark brush strokes that look to me like the borders of separate bodies, um, but then they are entangled in each other, which made me think of how the memory or even characteristics and stories of people can live on in others, in their loved ones, their children, their students and classmates, or even like these brush strokes create separate pieces of ourselves where our memories turn us into someone else for a little while, looking a different way, being different in another space. And in the painting, the larger one, not just the small section that made it onto the book's cover, um, it looks like there are even bits of newspaper articles kind of weaved into the canvas, embedded in the paint. And he made this with acrylic and acrylic paste and paper on canvas. It's 150 centimeters by 150 centimeters. So it's almost five feet by five feet. It's a large piece. Um, and it's sort of just visually overwhelming. And I look at it and I see a few different faces. Some look older and more weathered. Some are very small and look very young. And there are spaces on the piece that are blood red. Uh, but what really jumped out to me from the first look were the yellows and the blues and purples. Um, there is a seeming chaos of cool and warm colors, but the black brush strokes that to me represented bodies or even faces especially, those borders connect them all. So when I was researching different visual material to incorporate into the cover design and I saw Anessa's works and I reached out to him, I felt that his wall of memories was such a powerful way to give my readers a visual from the very start of how complicated Syria and Lebanon are, how colorful, how tragic, and also how hopeful and how strong, um, how our connections to one another, which you can see kind of with the brush strokes, how they can help us see that in the painting and in the narratives that unfold in the book. And with the title, Wall of Memory, Memories, a wall can help keep a building from crumbling. It can help to have a strong foundation for it, but walls can also separate people and keep some out and trap others in. So there can be a lot of layers and meaning to it. It is beautiful. It's a really beautiful cover. Um, congratulations. I'm happy you were able to, to secure this, that the artist was, was agreed to this. So now, what about the title? Uh, Disturbing Spirits, uh, it can have multiple meanings. What are those meanings for you? Um, and how do they help us to think about the history of mental health in Syria and Lebanon? So there's a feeling I wanted to convey to readers with the multiple meanings in the book's title. And I felt Homsi's artwork also represented that in the cover design. So disturbing spirits can stem from a religious or spiritual idea of spirits like jinn, these beings of smokeless flame of fire, as in the Quran, or ghouls, or ghouls, and ifrits, demons, among others, that can cause disturbances or illnesses in people and other animals. The dog is like running around right now. What a good timing for the... But, <laughs> but this is a disease ideology rooted in beliefs that the supernatural and the natural worlds can and do influence each other. Um, a human being, male or female or in between, as, as you note in your first book, um, Sarah, with some individuals that appear in Ottoman medical and legal sources, any person might conjure or exercise a spirit should they be trained or blessed or cursed in the proper way to do, to do it. And a spirit, oh, the doggy wants to go outside. I'm just gonna ignore that. <laughs> okay. And a spirit, no, don't get scared. Okay, um, I don't know why he never does this. Um, and a spirit might possess a person or an animal should the spirit be so inclined. Oh, now this is like- There, 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 there like, is. He's, he's hearing me. <laughs> so, you know, the spirits disturb us. These ideas have been part of many faith traditions, including all three Abrahamic communities, Christian, Muslim, Jewish for centuries. So that's the first of the many meanings. And then the second meaning of disturbing spirits relates to trauma theory. We can experience 
a personally or collectively traumatic moment, and that can leave lasting damage on us. It can threaten a minority community's survival at an existential level, as anyone who's worked in genocide studies would see with research in Armenian, Rwandan, Bosnian, and Jewish communities, for example. There is a trauma that a person can experience on the physical, psychological, and emotional level. And, you know, we're talking about a part of the world that experienced famine in World War I, if you're thinking of Beirut and the hinterland, for example, of the Safar Barlik, the forced military service in the Ottoman army in the Balkan Wars, and in World War I, where many men didn't return. So there are generational traumas around World War I, and especially around the Armenian genocide of 1916, where many survivors made it to Lebanon and Syria. There were an almost unbelievable amount of dramatic political, economic, and social transformations in 20th century Lebanon and Syria. And I argue that dis that disturbed the psyche and emotional well-being of ordinary people, whether any individual among them had a pre-existing condition or not. So the historical moment disturbed our spirits. And I think we cannot understand history in Syria or Lebanon without holding both these ideas of disturbing spirits in our minds at once, that jinn belief shaped certain treatment modalities and the political conflict shattered communities. But then there's another meaning to the title that connects to the medical and social models of disability, that doctors treated certain people in destructive ways. And this is something that researchers have been turning their attention to more and more in the last few years, um, in the last few decades, really. And in your experience as president of the Disability History Association, I know you've seen um, you've seen this in a whole range of fields, not just in Middle Eastern history, that researchers have turned to lots of different sources to get at this understanding of what it means to heal or to fit in in a community. And there is in some ways a trauma to, to surviving the healing in and of itself. And this involves working with lots of primary sources, including religious and cultural artifacts used by the people who lived and died in those spaces, not just the hospital records that are left behind by doctors working to try to subdue or control people or to do what they thought would lead to improving their patient's quality of life. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, thank you, Barry, that's a great, great answer. Now, one of the things that really struck me the most about your book, about this wonderful book, is the wealth of primary sources. You truly collected an enormous amount and variety of primary sources. Um, how some previously untapped that nobody had ever used before, right? So what was your process um, for collecting your data? Can you walk us through it? Sure, yes. Yeah. So the sections of the book about the medieval and then the 19th century origins of medical spaces, like the schools, um, the medical schools and the modern hospitals, the Lebanese mental hospital in Beirut called Asfuriye, and the Syrian mental hospital just outside of Damascus called Ibn Sina. Those sections are based in part on my dissertation um, from when I was a graduate student at WashU. Um, and I had originally wanted my dissertation to be about um, the historical development of normality and abnormality and about how sectarianism was connected to that. And I was going to have sections about physical illness and mental illness both congenital and acquired, and a section on sexual behavior. And I would have this larger um, argument about how different agents within societies, whether it's government officials or medical experts, how they policed communities and shaped conversations about whose body and whose actions were right and whose were wrong. And what did those policing agents decide to do with the wrong people? And I wanted to span the century from the early 1900s when the Ottoman Empire still controlled the provinces that later end up as different countries in the Eastern Mediterranean to the present day. So it turned out that kind of project was way too large for an American graduate student to take on in Lebanon and Syria, especially the part about sexual behavior where the closest I could really get in data collection was illicit heterosexual relationships and data on venereal disease, but that wasn't what I was looking for. So I had to narrow down my focus um, and in the summer of 2008, when I was in the midst of my exploratory fieldwork in Damascus, and I had just received the go-ahead from the IFPO, the French Institute, um, from their branch in Damascus, which got me approval from the Syrian Ministry of Culture, which got me approval from the Syrian Ministry of Health, to work with some records from one of their mental hospitals, which is the Ibn Sina um, mental hospital that you mentioned was kind of an untapped um, resource. Um, I decided I would just keep the dissertation more narrow, just work with those records and the Lebanese ones. Um, and before I'd even left St. Louis for my first weeks-long trip to Syria, 
um, in 2008, it quickly became clear to me that it was best for political expediency um, if I not put any focus on the period since the Assad family had taken over the Syrian government. So, so I stopped in the early 1960s for my dissertation. And that's kind of where the, the data began, uh, working with the hospital records. Mm -hmm. It's very impressive that you were able to uh, receive permission for the Ministry, Syrian Ministry of Culture, to access the Ibn Sina uh, hospital records. Um, as someone who has done field work in Syria, I know how difficult <laughs> and sometimes impossible it is to get that permission. So yes, you you probably were lucky in in some ways, and and you know your luck is our benefit um, because you were able to produce this wonderful book. <laughs> um, speaking of your research, where did your research for this begin? How did it come about, and and how did it transform over the years? So yeah, I mean this definitely didn't start. Um, the way that it did for the dissertation to get to this part, um, which includes a big section on the Lebanese Civil War and the Syrian Civil War. Um, really, back in the summer of 2006, after I was finishing up, I just finished my first year of my combined master's PhD program at Washington University in St. Louis, and I was in Beirut taking a few summer classes in Arabic language and culture at the Lebanese American University. And I was wanting to focus at that point mainly on Lebanon instead of also on Syria um, for my dissertation. But the Israelis bombed the city I was living in and the airport. Um, and that freaked out my mom in New York, <laughs> um, who had already lived through a civil war in the 1960s in the Dominican Republic, which is where she's from, uh, before she moved to the United States um, in 1965. And so in 2006, for those of you who don't um, know me super well um, on this um, webinar tonight, that was just two years after I graduated from college. I was this young kid, pretty much. I'd been to the Middle East before since I'd done my junior year of college at Ben Gurion University um, in 2002 and 2003, um, but that was in Israel. And 2006 was the first time I'd been to Lebanon. And I flew straight to New York from Cyprus after the evacuation during the war. And I promised my mom I would not go back to Lebanon until this thing with Israel had calmed down. So you can see how that's going. But uh, I decided Syria as an authoritarian regime in some ways, very much like the one my mom had grown up under with the dictatorship of Rafael Leonidas Trujillo de Molina. Um, it wouldn't have the likelihood of developing into chaos on the streets. Um, it wouldn't even have petty crime because everyone is terrified in a police state. Um, and I and the other Americans on my program in Lebanon, we weren't evacuated immediately after the Israelis bombed the airport in Beirut. We, you know, it took a few days while the bombs fell. Um, and I do think that affected me a little bit to be sent along with the other students to LAU's other campus in Jvei and Biblos, which the LAU administrators rightly guessed would not get bombed by the Israelis um, because it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And we stayed there for a few days trying to focus on our classwork. Um, and then I get evacuated on a Nor Norwegian cargo ship from Beirut to Larnaca in Cyprus. And then I'm sitting on my mom's couch in Brooklyn, watching the news, seeing Lebanese and Israeli officials, speaking to international audiences, all while I knew that there were these people I had met, these teachers with families of their own, some of whom had been born when I was, except I grew up in New York City in the 80s and 90s, and they grew up in Lebanon's civil war. People who were not lucky enough to have dual citizenship to Canada, for example, and now they were trapped in Lebanon instead of being evacuated to Montreal. And I remember one of the teachers at LAU who was kindest to me, this elderly Greek Orthodox woman, um, as she saw me off on the bus that was going to take only the American students in the program back to the port, to the ship out of Lebanon, she said, remember me, Beverly, remember us, don't forget us. I never found out what happened to her in July, 2006. Um, and there are people I befriended in Damascus in 2009 and 2010, um, when I was there um, for about nine months of field with Fulbright Hayes that I haven't heard from since the Syrian civil war began. And others who I've heard from contacts were confirmed casualties. So I feel I have a duty to remember um, and that my memory is only going to go so far. But if I wrote about it, if I could find a way to connect my research, interests in normality and abnormality to this larger narrative about this call to care for one another, to care about people on the other side of the ocean or even the world, um, to care about the past, um, because it helps us understand the present, I thought it would help ease my survivor's guilt a little kind of selfishly, I guess, um, and also contribute in some small way to building a compassionate society here and elsewhere. Mm 
That is a, a, a very evocative and, and heartfelt and lovely answer, uh, Beverly, which is exactly who you are. Um, um, uh, now, uh, to switch gears just a little bit, um, what is the relationship for you between politics and health in, in global history, in world history? How are politics and health connected? Sure. Yeah, so I, I taught a class a few years ago that I called, sorry, the dog is like hitting the door again. I don't know if you guys can hear it. I can hear it. But anyway, I, I taught a class called The Politics of Health in the Modern Middle East um, uh, a few years back. And I've been teaching my world history course as uh, the survey course as science and technology and world history for a few semesters now. And I see those classes as a way to introduce students to this idea that science is more than what we see in modern day physics or math or chemistry departments. And that technology is more than applied science. And that medicine is so much more than what we see in cosmopolitan biomedical systems. So what constitutes science included magic for centuries. It included occult sciences, alchemy, astrology, divination. And it was different to different communities and different parts of the world and everywhere. Science became what powerful people, including powerful religious people, in those areas wanted it to be. It could mean that a royal patron supported the study of the stars so that the astronomers could also be effective astrologers. And it could mean that an emperor would support veterinary medicine because they needed the war horses to recover from injuries. And science could be used to classify people, as Carl Linnaeus and Charles Darwin did, according to phenotype and gender. And those classifications came with hierarchies that were justification for racist practices, including enslavement based on phenotype and ideas about races more generally. So political agendas can weaponize medical and scientific practices, as we've seen only too well amid the current pandemic with anti-vaccination and conspiracy theories. But it can seem more innocuous in other ways. So you can have a government like the Israeli government once did justifying draining of wetlands to remove mosquitoes to eliminate malaria. So there's an ecological component, an environmental one, or it can lead to international conflicts like war. Um, a government as the US government once did can justify invading Cuba because they're tracing back yellow fever outbreaks in the US South to Havana. And they claim they need to protect US borders to, from this scourge. And many immigrant absorbing countries like the US and Israel have had very specific medical policies with immigration that included some pretty awful practices, including racist ones, like with Yemeni Jews having their heads shaved because the Ashkenazi doctors assumed they had lice when they didn't. Um, and Egyptians chafed under British imperial control in the early 20th century. They could see that the cholera outbreak that was brought to Cairo by Indian soldiers in the service of the British empire, they, they saw this as proof of why the British are unfit to rule Egypt. And there's a line in one letter to bring it to the US example. There's a line in one letter to the editors in this May 1954 issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry, where an article was titled Medical Legal Problems in Psychosurgery. And the writer, another psychiatrist argues that on the whole, lobotomized patients make rather good citizens. So health can be politicized and politics can shape health agendas and what a community's leaders may see as their goals for building a stronger, fitter community. Um, um, thank you, Beverly. Now, so from the general to the particular, um, how have uh, politics and health intersected in Lebanon and Syria? In other words, how have political issues in Lebanon and Syria shaped uh, the health of people in the region? Yeah, so Lebanon civil war that was 1975 to 1990 and the Syrian civil war that began in early 2011 and is still raging 10 years on, those wars have taken an enormous toll on people. Um, hospitals have been targeted by Bashar al-Assad's regime. Doctors and nurses were kidnapped in the Lebanese civil war. Some of the Lebanese medical records mention this. Um, and they've been kidnapped in the Syrian civil war for attempting to help injured people that the government or various militias considered to be opposition. And two weeks ago, Syria was appointed to the World Health Organization's executive board for a three-year term, and it will help set the agenda for the WHO Health Assembly and help implement WHO policies. And you can imagine how frustrating that is for, for Syrians who have died and seen, and, and seen their families die. Um, the, the Syrian-American lawyer and novelist, Alia Malek, wrote in her family history 
and journalistic nonfiction piece, The Home That Was Our Country, that the Civil War has reached a level of violence that would consume it whole and eventually damage the collective mental health of its people. And the Syrian dictator, whose family has controlled Syria for five decades and killed many tens of thousands of people, most infamously in Hama in 1982, but all over the country in this civil war, he declared himself victor with over 95% of the vote a few days ago. Um, and, but entire neighborhoods have been decimated. The world seemed to sit by as the government turned on its own citizens in Syria and foreigners have been streaming in for years, bringing in nihilistic levels of violence. Syrians were fighting tyranny, as did others in 2010 and 2011, all over the Middle East, part of a pattern of over a century of political organizing when groups felt hope that there could be real change. And it's been so, so frustrating in Syria and Lebanon to see what's, what's still happening. Yeah, absolutely. So you think that we, we can think of healing in as both medical and political? Absolutely. So it's really, for me, I kind of think of it as, as a spreading disease. So what, what Bashar al-Assad is doing to Syria, he's choking it, he's killing it. Um, and it's an outgrowth of trauma, um, many, many traumas that were heaped onto different communities within Lebanon and Syria, not just the Lebanese and Syrian citizens, but also the refugees among them. Um, that, that live and have lived in Lebanon and Syria for decades, including the Armenians, Palestinians, the Kurds, there are Iraqi communities, among others. Um, and you're going from the famine of World War I and the murderous betrayal of the Ottoman Empire's Committee of Union and Progress um, that, the, the con that committed the genocide on Armenians in 1916 to the indignities of the interwar French mandate in both Lebanon and Syria. And then there are these post-colonial crises that develop and devolve into these civil wars um, in situations where the healthcare system is nearly or has collapsed, as it did in Lebanon and has in Syria today, people who needed support before the civil war are left more vulnerable than just about everyone else. Hospitals don't have the medical supplies. They don't have the staff. Patients were just let out onto the streets in Beirut from Asfuriye, and then the Israelis bombed the new location of the hospital just as it was trying to deal with near bankruptcy. So it closed. Asfuria closed in 1983. The mental hospitals on the outskirts of Aleppo and Damascus are in regime controlled areas. And I know a few doctors who had to dodge snipers getting in and, and out of work at Ibn Sina Mental Hospital. And those doctors are in Germany and Turkey now. Um, and they're still working as psychiatrists. They contribute to refugee work um, and organizations like Syria Bright Future um, and telehealth services like Dr. Mohammed Abu Hilal like Dr. Usama Ashughri, Dr. Mahmoud Nadav, and in the Za'atari refugee camp on the Jordanian border, some refugees were also practicing psychologists, volunteering their services for years at the camp while they were a refugee in the camp, like Dr. Adnan Ribdawi. But for the patients who haven't been able to get to those refugee camps, who are still in Syria, and for the patients who were in Lebanon during their civil war, these are not the kinds of conditions that are in any way well-suited to effective treatment. And the stigma around mental illness, the stigma made seeking help very difficult for families. Patients were often confined to the house as a micro asylum, as Dr. Abdul Masih Khalaf called it in his research in the 1980s. So there have been and continue to be very real struggles of people living with mental illness, the consumers, the survivors, the ex-patients in the Middle East and beyond. And now that the system has collapsed, people are recognizing that trauma is a real thing. Post-traumatic anxiety and post-traumatic stress and depression are real. Um, but you know, health is embedded in specific cultural moments. So if a community doesn't give people the support to identify a health challenge as something that can be addressed safely in a way that includes all who are suffering, rather than just focusing on the powerful parts of society that may label certain sufferers as threats to social order, as insignificant and marginal groups, as not as worthy of good health as some other class of people, another race or ethnic group, another socioeconomic class, another linguistic or religious or cultural group, valuing permanent residents or citizens more than migrants or refugees or rural communities or the elderly, there's a level of compassion and empathy that we must achieve to really drive this point home, that all people deserve to be healthy, 
that health inequities are a form of injustice, that national projects that privilege a few groups are harmful to society as a whole, not just to the less privileged. Um, once a government, a political party, a militia decides that a certain group's health is more important than another's in the same country, in their own borders, you are walking a fine line there with sectarianism, with ethno-nationalist conflict, leading to ethnic cleansing and devastation, to carving out a piece of yourself, like with Jews pushed out of Syria and Lebanon, Armenians nearly annihilated in Anatolia, Yazidis in Iraq, even Alawis in Syria, who are not supporting the Alawi Assad regime, and who are targeted just for their religion by the violence-oriented Salafist groups. And this is not to say all Salafists support violence. Very few do, in fact. But we're talking about a minority of Salafis who have moved to an extreme and violent place and who are vocal and active. And some individuals, like the Greek Orthodox communist fighter Soha Bashara in Lebanon, frame political upheaval and violence as a form of healing. The Martinican psychiatrist Frantz Fanon considered the Algerian War of Independence from France in the 1950s and 60s as a kind of catharsis, cathartic violence. So some people may identify political change as a form of healing the diseased national body, where, for example, colonialism or authoritarianism or tyranny is the disease and it must be cut out of the body for the rest to survive. And identifying any part of the community as part of the sickness can take you down this dark path to eugenics, for example. So there are a lot of ways in which health and politics are intertwined all over the world and especially also in Syria and Lebanon. <clears throat> Continuing to talk a little bit about sources. So um, what was it like for you to work with all these, these data? Um, given that your material spans medical and political issues from a century ago to the present day. So it's a very long time span, right? Um, in what ways did you find that some of your material or methodological approaches were more challenging than others? Where did you find the most challenge? Yeah, so um, I had, for example, Syrian psychiatric patient records from the 1930s, handwritten in Arabic, doctor's handwriting. <laughs> and I had typed out annual reports in English from the Lebanese hospital directed to their donors in London um, and all over the, the Western world. So while were, they were both medical sources, in a sense, they really um, were very different and they, it entailed very different kinds of effort on my part. Um, English is my mother language and I didn't learn Arabic until college. And, you know, phrases from, you know, a medical file in the 1930s can be very different from what you've learned at school in the 2000s. So there was some work that I did with my dictionary, uh, many dictionaries, um, and some with interviewing medical professionals in Syria, asking them about kind of terms that show up and where they saw some change if they remembered it from their grandparents. Um, so there was also historical fiction. Um, some was written in modern standard Arabic, some was in English or French, so those were a little easier to work with more quickly. Um, and historians, when we work with works of fiction, we aren't, we, we aren't really approaching the material in the way someone in comparative literature might. So I'm looking at the way a novel may be a metaphor about something going on in society at the moment that the novelist penned or published the work. Um, and with historical fiction specifically, as opposed to, like, say, for example, surrealist, um, I may be looking for descriptions of something that happened in real life. And then I interview the author to ask where things diverged and why they wrote about something the way they did, as with Anas Abu Ismail's A Melody of Tears, of Sorrows of Syria. And there was field work that I conducted in Syria where I collected data in interviews with physicians or religious leaders who spoke to me in a mix of Lebanese or Syrian dialects of Arabic and modern standard Arabic. And in Israel, I, I could be speaking to someone and we'd be switching back and forth between Hebrew, Arabic, and English. Um, my, my reading French skills are much better than my spoken French, and I cannot tell you how many times I was mistaken for Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian when I was in Lebanon, Syria, or Jordan, but the second I tried to respond to people in the French that they assumed I spoke fluently, you could see, like, the confusion on their faces. <laughs> As I explained, I was half Dominican and from the United States. I had to explain one time where the Dominican Republic was. I mean, after a while, I just kind of went along with it. Like, I smiled, and I would tell them, you know, 
you know, the, the Dominican side of my family has roots in Southern Spain. Maybe there's some Maghrebi connection, who knows? Um, but I was not um, usually forthcoming about the Ashkenazi half of my heritage, uh, given that one Syrian government official, um, based on how he was questioning me, seemed to think I was a Zionist spy. <laughs> and in Israel, I've been accused I think it was half jokingly on being an American spy um, in Israel um, because my Hebrew is pretty good. Uh, but really, the biggest challenges that I faced outside of people thinking I was a spy, <laughs> I was like, "You're so sweet. Why would I be a spy?" And they're like, "It would be you." But, <laughs> but really, <laughs> the biggest challenges I faced was honestly was the the vicarious trauma, the secondary traumatic stress. And those of you that are um, watching this tonight, listening, who are in other fields. You may have seen this in your own work. I mean, it can happen to lots of people, journalists, healthcare workers, anyone working for weeks at a time on war, ethnic cleansing, hate speech. We risk carrying that pain with us. Interacting with survivors, analyzing photographs or documentaries, seeing parents in shock as they carried their dead children. It absolutely affected me as a parent and as a person. One doctor I interviewed, a U.S.-based Syrian nephrologist, Anas Abu Ismail, he was receiving real-time messages from contacts in Syria as the civil war unfolded. And he told me when I, when I interviewed him that he suffered from vicarious trauma as well when he wrote his 2013 book, A Melody of Tears, Sorrows of Syria. He had these detailed medical descriptions of what was happening to these little bodies as they stopped breathing, and it haunted me. And the same for the material by Samar Yazbek the Alawi writer that's living in exile, who opposes the Alawi Bashar al-Assad regime. And she wrote The Crossing, My Journey to the Shattered Heart of Syria. She wrote A Woman in the Crossfire, Diaries of the Syrian Revolution. Her descriptions in those books um, of children caught in the crossfire, like a four-year-old boy who was waiting quietly in a bed. And she watched him as he waited for a doctor to remove the cluster bomb shrapnel in his chest without anesthesia because they didn't have any. But if they left the shrapnel in, oh, yeah. uh, he would cry, he would, it, he would die as it crumbled in his little chest. And it overwhelmed me. It was an awful feeling to put that book down and look at my four-year-old twins, who were four years old at the time, um, after reading that, to see how lucky I was, how much tragedy another mother or father or other relative was enduring if they were still alive even. It took a lot of learning about my own limits before I was able to cope with that material well. But I, I've also seen my deep sense of connection help people. I mean, people have told me that they have, hopefully they're being honest with me, but it can be uncomfortable, but it can get us from apathy to empathy, beyond that comfort zone that protects us from acknowledging the pain of it all. That push can be just enough to open people up to listening to each other, to participate actively in learning about the past, and about present conflicts, about engaging in conflict resolution, whether in our own communities or overseas. Because honestly, what happened in Lebanon, what's been happening in Syria and in Yemen, all of that is a moral outrage to me. We can't, we can't sit by and let this keep happening. Like Dr. Abu Ismail put it in part of his book where the, the character Céline Dubois is a French journalist and novelist, but she marries a Syrian opposition member and she says in the book, it's not a Syrian issue, it is a human issue. Thank you so much, uh, um, <clears throat> Your work is interdisciplinary, clearly interdisciplinary, and deeply interdisciplinary. So how does working with different sources and using methods from different disciplines, like history and anthropology, and also for interdisciplinary fields like disability studies and trauma studies, how, um, how do they help in your research and writing? Yeah, so I was trained as a historian in my master's and PhD program, but my undergraduate program at Brandeis University was a major in Near Eastern and Judaic studies, and I had a double minor in Islamic and Middle Eastern studies and in legal studies. So I had interdisciplinary roots in approaching Middle Eastern topics, I guess you could say. Um, and my dissertation committee at Washington University in St. Louis was chaired by the very excellent Nancy Reynolds, but I also worked with Ahmed Kara Mustafa, who has made a lot of contributions in the field of religious studies, and Nancy Berg in film and literary studies, and of course Hilal Kival on my committee, he's a historian, but he was so important in helping me think comparatively about Jewish and Muslim communities, and Tim Parsons helped me think globally with his work on Africa, Kenya especially, and the British Empire. 
So it helped me with my, my work on the French Empire. So in working with my advisors, and then in complementing the social and cultural history approaches in which I was trained, um, with a little bit more on medical history, um, with a study of these two psychiatric institutions that are focus of two of the chapters in the book, I was then able to branch out further with the literary material and with approaches in trauma studies and disability studies that are inherently interdisciplinary fields um, to work with a focus on survivors, not just on doctors. Um, and sometimes there was overlap in that group as with Heran Kachadurian's memoir. So he was a Beirut-trained, Turkish-born, Armenian psychiatrist who later became Dean of Stanford University in California. But in his memoir, he writes about the trauma of a childhood illness he suffered. And he and other writers like Hannah Minna have moments in their autobiographical and semi-autobiographical works where they, they talk about folk, you know, popular vernacular healing, practices that exist on the margins of what medical experts might consider effective treatment. So these are the reasons I, I complement the more traditional historical sources like newspaper or hospital records with these literary and creative sources. And in disability studies and in trauma studies, historical fiction can really reveal how a specific writer has processed or is processing traumatic events, including the experience of being sent to a psychiatric hospital and undergoing treatment like electroshock therapy, um, which happens to the main character, Zahra, in Hanan al-Sheikh's The Story of Zahra. Novelists and short story writers can put in fiction what their governments may refuse to see published in nonfiction. So in some ways, um, these kinds of sources are more accurate than one might think. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Anas Abu Ismail's The Melody of Tears, Sorrows of Syria, has very detailed descriptions of the first few years of the current civil war in Syria. And he has numerous passages that relate to the reader what he was getting from contacts in the country who were desperate to get the attention of people in the United States, in the United Kingdom, to explain what horrors were unfolding in the country, to plead for international relevance to not be ignored, to try to save lives. And with the earlier periods, I worked with historical fiction like Ulfat Dilbi's Sabriya, Damascus Bittersweet, and the short stories of the medical doctor Abdul Salam al Arjeli about madness or insanity in the countryside under the French mandate. And I really found those pieces to be such powerful complements to the hospital records. They were for different audiences in many ways, but I felt that including such a diverse group of sources helped me develop a more nuanced picture of the past and the present. It certainly did, yes. Um, I think we're coming perhaps for our last question so that we can give time for, uh, leave some time for Q&A. Um, and so I'm going to bring you back um, to the present. Not that we really left the present that much, but really now, let's, let's go back to today. So the Syrian um, civil war has, has caused a refugee crisis, a, ter a terrible refugee crisis, and the Syrian government still remains in power. How would you hope that your book, Disturbing Spirits, um, might be able to shape U.S. and other powerful countries' foreign policy for Syria. That's a lofty goal. How does yeah. our scholarship, um, how could it help if you if you could talk to politicians? How, how What would you say to them? Yeah, so it, it's been like for years, pretty much since probably 20, 2012 or so, when things were really getting awful in Syria, it's been my, my pie in the sky dream that somebody in the government would be like, Yes, we will help everyone. Thank you, Beverly. But, um, but so really, as you know, though, Sada, we're having this conversation tonight on the heels of the G7 summit that was in England, the NATO summit in Belgium, the U.S.-Russian conversations in Switzerland. Um, Reuters reported a few days ago that the French president, Emmanuel Macron, spoke with Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan about working together on the war in Syria and on the conflict in Libya, among others. And it's really my hope that world leaders and heads of powerful international organizations like the EU and the WHO at the UN would see research like mine and like others about conflicts all over the world as a clarion call to ethical leadership. Um, and I will add that closer to home, since there are quite a few folks on the call tonight based in the United States, that I am a voting constituent in the city of Memphis. Um, and I hope that our folks in Congress quick name drop to Steve Cohen, I will be sending you a note on Twitter um, about this, um, can raise these issues with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee members. Yes, the United Nations is huge, but there are only a few member states 
with a permanent position on the UN Security Council and the United States, the United Kingdom and France are three of those members. I know what you're thinking, Russia and China are the other members, but you know, we have an opportunity here to work together, especially with two of the 10 non-permanent members on the Security Council right now being India and Tunisia. Um, so I won't pretend to know what is going on in the hearts and minds of anyone, let alone world leaders. I only wish I had that kind of superpower, but um, I would hope that the tragedy that has unfolded in Syria for over a decade now, and the tragedies unfolding elsewhere in the region, like in Yemen, would bring people to the table to work together, who have often seen each other only as adversaries. The U.S. has a military and economy that could influence just about anywhere. But it's not just a foreign policy issue to me, it's, it's about welcoming the stranger in our own midst, because this stranger has survived the unimaginable. We have an opportunity here to build resilience. Migrants and refugees have untapped potential worldwide. There are lots of places in Latin America, Asia, and Africa struggling with similar legacies of imperialism, colonialism, ethnic cleansing, and other forms of injustice. So I would hope that our governments would agree on a path and especially in the US be the beacon of freedom our leaders sometimes claim that it is. Um, so let's sustainably support people that have been pushing for their own freedom for decades. And let's take care of each other. We owe it to ourselves and each other. And I know it's hard, but we have to start somewhere because our lives and our future depend on it. Thank you so much, Beverly, for your passion and your empathy. You're one of the most empathetic people I've ever met in my life. So that really, I think it, it really showed through uh, your talk tonight. So I'm, thank you. I'm going to clap. I'm going on a big clap here because we cannot hear the, the participants. So thank you so much. And we're now going to open it to, um, uh, to questions from the audience. Um, you can write your question in the Q&A box or also in the chat. So the first question for you, Heather, is someone who first of all congratulates you on tenure, almost there, and uh, tells you, <laughs> yes, you can see how awesome you are. <laughs> um, and the question is, so in the US, the prison system is one of the largest um, administrators of mental health care. Do you see any similar um, imprisonment of the mentally ill um, over small crimes? So that's a really good question. Um, there was, so the, the Syrian um, medical records came um, in these files that had like a printed template. Um, and the template actually had three sections about where um, the individual um, that became hospitalized had come from. And one of the three was prison. Um, it was from the home, from some other place or from prison. Um, and, and there was, that was in the Syrian hospital records. There was also in the Lebanese one, um, there was a, a number of sections in the annual reports going back um, from like the early 1900s um, into um, kind of the period where uh, where the where the hospital um, collapsed and closed in the 1980s. They mentioned that the director of the hospital would often be brought in um, as kind of a forensics person um, in the court um, to try and vet whether um, a person that was that had been arrested. Um, was mentally um, capable to stand trial um, or um, if they should be just put in the hospital rather than in prison. Um, there wasn't a lot of information um, in the hospital records that I saw about what it was that they did that made it to, um, that made the, the police aware of them and interested in, in kind of um, in, incarcerating them. There was, there was one record where, where a young man um, was really upset. And actually, he, his file was, was very um, detailed, which was exciting because some of these hospital records only would have like the name of the patient, the place where they were, their age, um, the place where they grew up, um, and the dates of their um, admission and release, and occasionally the, the treatment they were given, like Largactil, uh, like chlorpromazine, um, you know, before um, the kinds of medicines that you see um, in the 1960s and 70s. But this guy, he had gone to mosque on a Friday. Um, he had been accompanied by a woman and um, a mule or donkey. And then after the prayers, he couldn't find her or the donkey. And he was really mad. Um, and he kind of wandered around and, and kind of, I think had probably like a psychotic break. And then um, he threatened some people in the souk, the market around the mosque. And so people considered him 
kind of a potential, um, someone who might be potentially harming himself or others. And so that was when um, he was sent to the hospital rather than um, the prison, because luckily I think the police had been asking around. They were very detailed in, in his file um, and they knew that he had had a history of kind of um, what you might consider aberrant behavior, um, public nudity, um, and kind of incoherent thoughts. So they just sent him to the hospital. Um, but Heather has a really good point about the United States too, and also um, homelessness, um, which was something that came up when I was having a conversation um, with a friend, Megan Carter, who's a, a lawyer um, in Chicago. Um, and had there was a real kind of um, correlation between um, mental illness and homelessness in the United States, um, and in the kind of revolving door of the prison system and the hospitals and and um, it's it's hard to, I mean, living on the street would make anybody kind of frayed at their edges, even just two or three days out on the street, you could you could be in a completely different space, headspace. So you can imagine um, how vulnerable people may be um, when they're um, in a situation, um, and this is something that shows up um, in a few different um, research studies about, um, uh, mental illness and the prison system and homelessness and hospitalization in the United States is that people don't have the support network to get um, the the health care access that they need um, and then they might if they had a job they didn't have good health insurance um, or they, they didn't have um, the kinds of um, coverage for the for the medication that was being prescribed or the medication gave them horrible side effects and then um, they they go off their meds and then they can end up losing jobs um, and losing their place of, of, of um, residence. And homeless shelters are completely flooded um, all over the world, but including in the US in the pandemic. So it's, it's really, um, the, you know, the prisons are not the place that, that people should be getting their health care um, in any situation, let alone mental health care. But it is really, it's, it's a real tragedy. The, the files that I saw, um, I only worked with about 110 cases, um, but there were over 11,000 patients at the Mencina Mental Hospital um, between the 1920s um, and the 1980s was kind of where I stopped kind of peeking through the data. Um, but yeah, there are, there, there is an unfortunate level of fear around um, working with and helping um, people who are, um, you know, have these, what you might consider invisible um, differences. Um, because you could be walking by someone on the street, and this shows up in one of the, the um, short stories from the 1950s um, about um, madness um, comes in many forms. And um, it was only her, that girl's madness, Jumeila, in the book, um, who it, it became visible. Um, but um, the visibility of her aberrant behavior was uh, made her a target um, for, um, for being kind of effectively incarcerated in the asylum. Uh, because they were not really curative spaces. I mean, even in the United States, you, you would have seen um, people, um, you know, before the deinstitutionalization movement in this country, um, people were sent away and forgotten. It's not like they were being helped. They were not rehabilitative spaces um, for many years. Um, so yeah, it is, it's a real kind of tragic thing to work on. And I am, like Sada said, I'm a pretty empathetic, like we were talking earlier about how my heart is not inside my body. It's like out there, like getting beaten up and, and trying to hug other hearts. And it's like not, not a healthy way to live necessarily, but it, it's, you know, it's really hard to not feel connected um, to people, um, even if they're really different from you. Like, it's just, everybody's human, you know, and so people kind of deserve to be treated that way, I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> not everybody's like you, Beverly, but yes, we wish. <laughs> there are three more questions. So maybe we, one in the Q&A and two in the chat. So maybe we just want to talk briefly about COVID-19 uh, to stay in the United States for a second. And uh, um, as you can see, the, uh, the question is, um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on the mental toll of COVID-19, specifically in populations that rely so much on social connections. And so what are some possible solutions that policymakers should consider? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you, Dorothy, for being awake, because she's in Paris, France right now. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, the, and yeah, and, and France is having a really hard time with COVID as well. So it's, yeah, so the mental toll of COVID, I can, I can just speak also from my own experience, having 
virtual kindergarten for my two five-year-olds who just turned six. I mean, I was so lucky that I was able to keep my job. I still have health insurance. I could use, you know, telemedicine um, for um, therapy. Um, I, you know, my, my partner and I, we both have a job and we both can work from home. Um, but there are so many people. That's only like, I think NPR measured it um, recently as only like 40% of the U.S. population that was working could even do that, telecommute for most of, of, of the time of all this. Um, but when you, when, you, when you Zoom all the time and you're not physically touching anyone else, I mean, there's, there's something really um, physiological to the human touch. Like there's a reason that preemies, uh, you know, that, that parents are, are encouraged um, and nurses are, are and people in the NICU are encouraged to kind of touch the baby. I mean, there's something to um, just the oxytocin of being, of bonding with other people um, and being able to see people instead of through a screen, but to like to read their their body language when you know I'm like this little face on on the computer I'm like I can't reach you guys but it's like there's I I honestly I and you know there, for different communities in some ways the the whole experience of, of switching to virtual um, was easier for for some people um, maybe if they were on the autism spectrum or if they had felt really uncomfortable um, about being around other people. And here you have this protection. Your computer can protect you in some ways um, if, if, you're, if that's just how you interact with, with other people. Um, so it's really, I think the mental toll varies with different um, people. I wouldn't say it's something that you can generalize to a whole population even. Everyone in my own household, I think, has been had, has had a different mental toll with it. Um, but I think the solutions for policymakers, I, you know, I have to say I'm such a huge fan of um, vaccines and masks and um, social distancing, or I guess you could call it physical distancing, because socially we still want to connect. Let's not have, you know, I know it sounds cheesy, but let's not have emotional distancing. Let's have, like, Let's be be there for each other. I mean, honestly, just like calling somebody that hasn't seen someone in a while. Um, I, I was really um, kind of amazed at the way a lot of um, communities of faith pulled together um, during this period. And, you know, you don't have to be, I mean, any, any community can, can set up a system in which everyone that's in their group, you know, it could be Black, Indigenous, people of color. It could be anyone in the queer community that's being feel that's feeling really isolated. Um, you can you don't have to be like a person of faith for this to work. Is my point. But you can have a whole range of um, events that can include you know book clubs or um, really having these heart to heart connections with other people. That could be over the phone. They could be over WhatsApp. I you know over Skype or FaceTime. Um, policymakers, I think, really need, especially in this country, to find the way to reach the populations that are struggling the most. So, for example, um, students who had to switch to virtual kindergarten who had ADHD, you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, who deficit, who were who were deaf or blind. NPR just had an article about this. Nonverbal children. I mean. The schools, like, we literally have a law that says, you know, people were supposed to have individualized, you know, educational programs, and that has failed in this country. And, and we're, like, in the best case scenario. You know, I can't even imagine what's been happening um, in, in, you know, migrant communities and refugee communities, um, places where the governments don't care about you in the first place. Um, it's just, I think with COVID, I mean, I, when I teach my science and tech and world history class and we watch, um, I screen for them this um, documentary from PBS from 1998 about 1918 um, to 1920, the influenza pandemic. Um, and we talk about, you know, where there are parallels and where there aren't. So like now um, women have the right to vote in this country. They did not in 1918. Um, uh, black people have the right to vote. Um, you can totally and rightly point out that there's not very much that's changed um, for Black Americans, African Americans in this country um, over the last hundred years. It's like a little bit, but you know, really not enough. But um, but 
there's we have an electron microscope now. We know that the coronavirus is a virus. People didn't know that the influenza virus was a virus in 1918. They thought it was bacteria, you know, and the, the masks they were using. I mean, it was not an N95, um, which, by the way, had its roots with a, a Chinese Malaysian doctor who discovered how to do that. So it's really an important contribution um, to, to public health um, coming from um, this Chinese Malaysian man. But we have you know, back then it was like dust through chicken wire. That was what the mask was helping you with in 1918. Now we know better. Like, why are we not doing better? Like, this is so frustrating for me. <laughs> so when I'm teaching this to my students, I'm like, you know, there are some parallels to 1918, but there's, it's not exactly the same. Like we, we do, you know, we have the capability now to be online with each other. We couldn't in 1918. We have the capability to set up um, Zoom meetings about systemic racism and health disparities that set up Black Memphians um, to be sicker before COVID even hit. Um, and so we can have these conversations um, and, and kind of push policymakers to see what's happening. Um, you know, maybe people like DeSantis in Florida are like, la la la, don't hear you. But like, eventually enough people, I would hope, would, would see what's, what's really happening um, and, and try and help each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Bavia. <laughs> Bad for president. Um, <laughs> no, I would be so stressed out. I would not. Be. <laughs> we we really have gone over time. It's eight or five. I am wondering if you maybe we continue your conversation with um, Jesse Gordon and, and Charles Belanke, who have left uh, um, those. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cut anyone off. But we really are over time. Would it be okay, Beverly, if you just communicated with them and answered the question? Um, but I do want to give a shout out to both of them. Jesse is an awesome family medicine physician, and I love your work and keep that up. And Charles, <laughs> thank you so much for all your work you do in Memphis, um, Charlie. Uh, but yeah, there we can. Yeah, that's that, those are big questions. It's a big question, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We will keep this conversation going. I do talk about both of those things a little more. <laughs> You're muted, cat. <laughs> Realize that? Too late. Uh, well, I did drop the link in our chat to order Beverly's book. Um, if anyone, and you can just search it at novelmemphis.com. No trouble at all um, with that either. Um, thank you both so much for the conversation. It was so thoughtful, so interesting, so um, illuminating. We appreciate it. Congratulations on the book, Carmelia. I know it's a really big, big milestone. Thank and you. on your upcoming tenure. Amazing. Yeah, I couldn't have done it without, like, I was standing on the shoulders of awesome people like Sada and Peggy Caffrey, who read every single line of this and helped me make it beautiful. So, so yeah, it's really... Oh, um, Jonathan Chudakin said the link to order the book. Yeah, it's up. If you scroll up. Hey, Jonathan, thank again. you. Okay. There you go. Ta-da. Double linked. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone who attended. Um, we're going to have this up on our YouTube channel next week. Realistically, probably next week when I get that done. But uh, I'll be sending the the link to the IRA panelists and so they can they can distribute to anyone who missed it tonight. And y'all, I just want to say be well. I love you guys. Be good. <laughs> Thank y'all. We love you too. We love you too, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.